Tonight we gather to remember what was accomplished on the cross, to remember the circumstances that led Jesus to the cross, to remember the love that kept Jesus on the cross, and to remember the redemption given through the cross. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not understand it. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Merciful Father, I confess that I have sinned in desire, thought, word, and action. Because of my sins, I deserve your wrath. But you promise forgiveness, and so I come to you seeking pardon for my sins and renewal for my spirit. Cast me not away from your presence, but forgive, restore, and renew. For Jesus' sake and in his name I ask it. Christ was crushed for our iniquities and punished for our sins. We have peace with God through the blood of Christ, our substitute. It is therefore my cheerful duty to announce that all of your sins are forgiven by the perfect life and innocent death of Jesus Christ. Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss the son, or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. We continue with our psalm. Thank you. 
Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes for false witness.
The Old Testament lesson is taken from Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root from dry ground. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering. Like someone whom people cannot bear to look at, he was despised, and we thought nothing of him. Surely he was taking up our weaknesses, and he was carrying our sufferings. We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt of our, that our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has charged all our guilt to him. He was oppressed, and we, he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent in front of its shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away without a fair trial and without justice, and of his generation, who even cared? So he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of the rebellion of my people. They would have assigned him a grave with the wicked, but he was given a grave with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, and no deceit was in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and allow him to suffer. Because he made his life a guilt offering, he will see offspring. He will prolong his days, and the Lord's gracious plan will succeed in his hand. After his soul experiences anguish, he will see the light of life. He will provide satisfaction. Through their knowledge of him, my just servant will justify the many, for he himself carried their guilt. Therefore I will give him an allotment among the great, and with the strong he will share plunder, because he poured out his life to death, and he let himself be counted with rebellious sinners. He himself carried the sin of many, and he intercedes for the rebels. Sends our Old Testament lesson. This evening's anthem will now be sung.
please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel is taken from St. John in chapter 19. Carrying his own cross, he went out to what is called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a notice written and fastened on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this notice because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. They also took his tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it. Instead, let's cast lots to see who gets it. This was so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So the soldiers did these things. Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his own home. After this, knowing that everything had now been finished, and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they put a sponge soaked in sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Please be seated. Before all the noblest dream, not 
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For meditation today, we turn our attention to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 27. At that time, two criminals were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. People who passed by kept insulting him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, experts in the law, and elders kept mocking him. They said, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. If he's the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants him, because he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him kept insulting him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, This fellow is calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, took a sponge, and soaked it with sour wine. Then he put it on a stick and gave him a drink. The rest said, Leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. After Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Suddenly the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks were split. Tombs were opened and many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised to life. Those who came out of the tombs went into the holy city after Jesus' resurrection and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were guarding Jesus with him saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they were terrified and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. This is the Word of God. Dear friends, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ lived and died. This Lenten season we've been looking at services under the general theme of God on trial. And whether you've ever actually been in a courtroom or not, you know that the one thing necessary in any trial is not a good attorney or even a good judge. But in order for a trial to be legitimate, there has to be some evidence that someone is either guilty or innocent. And every good attorney, whether it's a prosecutor or a defense attorney, will do their best to present evidence to support their side of the argument. We see plenty of evidence this evening as we look at this portion of Matthew's Gospel under the theme of God on trial. But there were people who were looking for such evidence. Imagine if we could take a 10,000 foot view of the crucifixion, or better yet, given our modern society, imagine you were a drone operator and you flew your drone over Calvary's Hill that afternoon. What would you see? You would see this crowd of people coming by, as they often did with other crucifixions. But you would also hear what they had to say. And what they had to say were one insult after another, as they looked for evidence. If you were the Son of God, come down from the cross. Give us some proof. Let's see some evidence that you are the Son of God. The chief priests mocked him too. It wasn't just the crowd of onlookers, people who wouldn't necessarily have known all the ins and outs of Scripture. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, also said, Hey, come on down if you are the Son of God. He saved others. Why can't he save himself? And then, of course, there were the two criminals, one on either side, and, and they also were insulting him. If you were the Christ, save yourself and us, they said. Don't forget about us. We'd like to get off the crosses too. All of these individuals, collectively, were looking for evidence that Jesus was really who he claimed to be that he was indeed the so-called Messiah, the Son of God, as he so confidently had told the chief priest the night before. 
They wanted evidence. People still want evidence today. If God is really in charge, if God really exists, then how come there's so much trouble in this world? If God is really there, how come it's science that we turn to when a pandemic breaks out? And it's science that comes up with the antidote. And it's science that does all this stuff. If God really cares, then how come I see some of his purported followers here on earth suffering? You see what the questions are all looking for. They're looking for evidence. Evidence that God is real. Evidence that God has the power that he claims to have and that we claim that he has. Now imagine we're not flying our drone over Calvary, but we're standing there among all those people. And that man in the center cross is the one we had been placing our confidence in. We'd been following him for three years. We had been learning from him. We had been supporting him with our income. We had been buying food for him and for all of us. We had seen what he had done. We were there when he fed a crowd of 5,000 people. We were there when he walked on water. We saw how he healed lepers and cripples and blind men and made mutes talk and cast out demons. We didn't just hear about him raising Lazarus. We were there to see it happen. We know what he can do. Why isn't he doing it? And we begin to wonder. Had he exhausted all of his power? Where's the evidence now? We've got plenty of past experience. It's all good. But man, we could sure use some right here, right now. And that would maybe shut some of these other people up and make us feel better about ourselves because we don't want to f think we've been following a fraud for the last three years, wasting our time. We want evidence. And sometimes isn't that true for us as God's people who weren't at Calvary that day, but who are God's people today? Lord, why did this happen? in my life. Why have you allowed this suffering into my life? Lord, why don't you do something about all these people in the world that are mocking you, that are ridiculing you, that make fun of your people, that make fun of us? Lord, don't you care that so many people, among them are your followers around the world, are suffering. Lord, where is some evidence that you have compassion, that you care? Here's the evidence. It's in a question. Not a question by the crowd, not a question by the chief priests, not a question by the thieves, but a question by Jesus. His question was rather insightful. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He had his own question. Why are you abandoning me? Not my father, my God. Why are you doing this? But of course he knew the answer to the question. He was, for those three hours, not just suspended above the earth in total darkness, because the sun had stopped shining. He was, for those three hours, absorbing all the terror of hell itself. He was going through what no one on this earth has ever been through, and what, because of him, no one on this earth would ever have to go through. Abandonment by God, completely forsaken by him who is love. And he was doing that for all those people there around him. He was doing that for the fellow over here and the fellow over there. He was doing it for Pilate who was still sitting in his palace. He was doing it for us. 
the earlier question. He saved others. Why can't he save himself? He could save himself. He could have done anything he would have wanted to do. He could have certainly come down from the cross, but he did not because he loved those people that were mocking him too much to come off the cross. He loved those people that were being crucified with him too much to do what they wanted, to save himself and them. Truth is, of course, he was in the process of saving them. Not from the executioner's cross, but from something far worse. He was on that cross to save mankind from eternal death as punishment for our sins. That's all the evidence we should ever need that God loves us. If we ever wonder, does God care? Does God really care about me? It's a big world, a lot of people in it. Has God forgotten little old me? And Jesus gives us the answer by what he doesn't do. He doesn't come down from the cross. He doesn't acquiesce to their demands. He doesn't shut them up as he knew he could have. But he remained nailed to that wooden cross, suffering, bleeding, dying, just for them, just for you, and just for me. But God does give evidence that he is indeed who he claims he is. Jesus gave evidence of it. We are told in the Gospel of Luke that during the course of the time the criminals were there with Jesus, one of them who had previously insulted him put his faith in Jesus. He said to him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response was, today you will be with me in paradise. Somehow during that period of hours, maybe it was because that criminal saw how Jesus reacted to all of the people and all of the insults hurled at him. Maybe it was because he heard nothing from Jesus' lips except words of love and compassion to his executioners and words of prayer to his heavenly Father. Maybe it was because of something Jesus said that isn't even recorded for us in the scriptures. But some way, by some means, by something he saw, something he heard, the Holy Spirit worked in this man a conviction that his fellow executioner, E, was not who everybody claimed he was, but instead was indeed who he claimed he was, his Savior. And he looked to him. That was God's evidence, part of it. But there was more evidence. Because not everybody around there came to realize who Jesus was, but some did. And not just by silent acts of Jesus' love, not just by soft and tender words which Jesus spoke, but by things that happened when this one died. Of course, we remember that the Romans, they were executing people all the time. This was not a one-time event. This was common in those days. This was their means of capital punishment. But when Jesus died, as Matthew recalls for us, the curtain in the temple suddenly was torn into all the way from the top to the bottom. The earth itself shook, rocks were split apart, tombs opened up, and dead people walked again. They were seen in the city after Jesus' resurrection. The centurion and those who were there guard, with him guarding Jesus understood what they saw. And in terror they said, truly this man was the Son of God. God gave them perhaps more evidence than they wanted, but all the evidence they needed that the one they had just put to death was his Son, was the Christ, was the Messiah. And so when we face questions in life, when we see our Lord mocked, 
when we perhaps ourselves feel that we would be ridiculed if we let our faith shine too brightly. Or perhaps we've already been ridiculed because we tried to do just that. And we begin to wonder, Lord, do you care? Lord, are you out there? God, are you in control? We have our answer. The evidence is clear. God is in control. God is who he says he is. God does what he claims to do. He has brought you and me salvation. There can be no doubt about it. There can be no appeals. The evidence is not just there a little bit. It is overwhelming. We have our salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has proven beyond any shadow of a doubt who Jesus is, what Jesus is, and what he has done for you, for me, and for all. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. God most holy, look with mercy on this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over into the hands of the wicked, and to suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins and forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We adore you and we worship you, O Christ. By your cross, you have redeemed the world. 